Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, we're going to delve into the artificial intelligence and touch just a little bit on quantum computing. Stay tuned right after this. I've been wanting to do this one for quite some time. It's a uh, um, quantum computing is kind of a passion of mine. It's something I'm very interested in, and of course, the AI is as well. As as it is a you know AI is a very fast growing market, and uh, two of the largest fields that are being uh, advertised to students today is AI and quantum. Those are the two uh, hottest topics to get involved with, and so. I wanted to touch on it a little bit, and so let's dive into it and and uh, and look at the uh, some of the things about artificial intelligence. I'm not going to go into the definition of artificial intelligence. Uh, I think there's a lot of videos on YouTube already that cover that, but um, I th there are three three things uh, uh, three areas that uh, uh, artificial intelligence is evolving to. Today we're in the narrow AI, AI stand, uh, band, and that is. We, we use deep learning, we, we have to gather all kinds of data, huge amounts of data, and then we have to do, uh, we have to do all these processes to generate models to help the machine learn based on what it sees and what it knows, and then it will be able to react. But it's only good for single, uh, single domain problems, that is, I can do one for a particular, like driving a car, or I could do one for uh, picking inventory or something like that. But as far as doing general domain stuff or being able to actually let the computer learn the way we do, that's not in narrow AI. That just doesn't work. There's the, uh, the, the next uh, area is broad AI. We're not there yet. So I just <laughs> these are <laughs> these are things that are being worked on. That is multitask, multi-domain, and multimodal. So it allows the uh, computer to learn with a lot less data. General AI is like we, like humans, learn. Uh, so there is some instruction given, there's trial and error, and there's some reasoning that's done behind it that allows the computer to learn uh, a new task. And that will fit most domains, uh, provided, you know, the computer has the instruction and the uh, education, if you will, uh, in order to understand the uh, types of problems it's trying to learn, and that gives it some broad autonomy. It's also a little scary because then we're starting to enter the era of HAL, the HAL 9000 with that one. So the uh, rule sets and the uh, types of problems that that has to solve are very, very difficult. So uh, the other thing in AI that's occurring is that computing requirements uh, are, uh, are increasing at about two and a half times every three months. And, uh, you know, over the past, I don't, this diagram probably isn't very good, it's not very dark, but uh, I will just tell you that uh, from, from about 2013 until now, the amount of computing requirements have increased over 300,000 times. Uh, you know, companies are trying hard to deliver that, but that's not sustainable. Uh, uh, you know, the typical supercomputer, and that is where a lot of these uh, AI learning uh, systems are working, is in the supercomputing realm. Those use about 10 to the ninth joules per operation. That's very expensive. And it, at the rate of increase of two and a half times every three months, we'll exhaust the world's energy supply, at, uh, you know, probably before 2030, maybe 2050, maybe 2025, maybe 2026. But definitely we will exhaust the energy supply uh, of the uh, earth. And, and AI is a cent, you know, the, the irony is, is AI is being used to understand the, uh, the impact of energy consumption on the planet. And so it's, 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 on the one hand, you have AI trying to manage energy, and on the other hand, you have AI using up all the energy. So uh, it's clear that the computing technology that we have right now is just not up to the task of delivering the needs for AI. Uh, humans use, just in contrast, humans use about 2,500 kilocalories a day. 
Uh, so about that's about 100 watts or so, uh, and 25 watts of that is for the brain. So we're about 10 to the fifth times more efficient than silicon in uh, being able to process and 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 perform AI tasks. So computers operating at the level of a human will consume about 10 megawatts up per hour, about a thousand dollars an hour, and produce about 10 to the 17th. Uh, in waste heat, that would be joules or watts, and uh, and that would be about sixty percent of what the Earth currently receives from the sun. So that's going to definitely have an impact on temperature. Uh, if most if it gets trapped in the atmosphere, if it you know, some of it's going to escape, some of it's going to get trapped. But uh, uh, yeah, that could raise the uh, temperature of the Earth between fifty nine degrees and one hundred and twenty three degrees Fahrenheit, or about fifteen C to fifty fifty C. Or so, so you don't have to worry about greenhouse gases. We'll cook ourselves with our own computers. Uh, is the answer to that? Uh, so, what needs to be done? So, effectively, we need to move from narrow AI, which is more computational intensive, over to general AI, which is less so, um, and and that would reduce the amount of computing uh, time required. Now, it, now, general AI may consume a, a lot more power, but so uh, it's it's it. What we we need a couple of things to to be really be able to do this. We need the the commercialization of quantum computers as well. So again, uh, in 1948, Claude Shannon wrote a paper uh, describing how bits or electrons could be used to represent information. Uh, Bit-based computing has served us very well over the past 80 years, but <laughs> we're reaching a limit on that as well. We need 12 atoms to store information uh, using bits, and that would be to store it to disk, of course, and, uh, and we're there. <laughs> I mean, that's where we're at right now. That's the density of, uh, of the, uh, drive, the uh, rotational uh, hard drive platforms that were there. Uh, they have, they're, they're trying different ways of rotating it and spinning it and shingling it and, and sticking it sideways and <laughs> to get the data on there, but you know, it, it's, uh, that's where we're at with that. So. Uh, bits have a, have one of two states. It's either on or off. And they, then quantum uses qubits, and qubits have two states for each qubit. Uh, they exist in two states simultaneously. I, I'll probably do a uh, a video that's entirely dedicated to quantum if that's of interest to you guys. Let me know in the comments if that's something you'd like to see. Again, there are, although I, most of the explanations I've seen on YouTube are horrible. <laughs> They're just. I don't know what they're trying to convey, but uh, basically, let's let's look at it this way: a classical computers scale linear in a linear motion. In other words, <clears throat> in order to double the amount of data, I have to double the number of bits. So, uh, obviously, a 32-bit computer stores less than a 64-bit computer. A 64-bit computer stores less than 128. But those are linear scales. Uh, up the ladder. Quantum computers scale exponentially. You have uh, 2 to the 16th, 2 to the 32nd, 2 to the 64th, and on up. So uh, the largest quantum computer currently in, in process of being built is at MIT, and that's 18 qu uh, qubits. So that has about 262,144 states. Uh, in that now, there's some complications when you get that when you start getting a lot of bits. You get the air rates go up, so the more qubits you have, the higher the air rate. So um, <clears throat> they're trying to reduce that somewhat in order to do it. Uh, the other problem with quantum computing today is it requires super cold temperatures because it uses Josephson's junction boxes uh, in order to do that. So it has to be cooled almost, oh, not quite, but almost to absolute zero to do that. Uh, and that uses uh, expensive liquid helium to get the uh, to get the temperatures down, as well as a number of stages of cooling to get it down to the chip. There have been a number of papers published recently that that go into a room temperature quantum, and those are using uh, those are using uh, carbon spheres to be able to do that. There are some others other technologies that are based on boron, uh, boron and nitride. Uh, so, yeah, there's some research that's going on there. Clearly, the quantum computing will not be on our desktops if it's using uh, supercooled uh, methods to cool it. We, there's no way any of us could afford that. But if it could become air temperature, then quantum computing would be viable even for our desktop. 
So the new more the news more the new Moore's law. I'll get it out yet. Is that the uh, currently quantum is doubling every twelve months. So the number of qubits that they started out with was five, and then they went to uh, seven, and then, and I think the current one that IBM has is sixteen. Uh, of course, MIT has uh, their eighteen, and then the next one up will be thirty-two, and then sixty-four, one hundred twenty-eight bit all the way up. Once it reaches about, this is what I remember from math, was if you're worried about uh, quantum computing's cracking uh, your RSA encryption, that can't happen. And well, th yeah, there is a algorithm that's been done, but it doesn't work feasibly until you get up around 4,096 qubits. So they got a little bit of a ways to get there before that that uh, that particular the RSA becomes invalid. Uh, so. Anyway, don't worry about that so much. So the news more, new Moore's law is this, and that's currently happening uh, over time, is that the uh, number of qubits are doubling. And of course, that has an exponential effect on the number of states uh, that we talked about earlier. So uh, I'm going to leave you with this quote. This is from Claude Shannon. Claude Shannon was the one that wrote the uh, paper on... Uh, on, uh, on binary or bit information theory. And he said, before 1948, there was only the fuzziest idea of what a message was. There was some rudimentary understanding of how to transmit a waveform and to process a, and receive a waveform, but there was essentially no understanding of how to turn a message into a transmitted waveform. Quantum computing is beyond that state, but it really is. Uh, if you were to compare the uh, level of, I guess, I guess the level of uh, um, mm, complexity or the level of understanding. Quantum computing is really back in about that time frame. About uh, the understanding is about just slightly after 1948, maybe 1950. So it is rapidly growing. I mean, they're not really having to relearn all of the things about information theory. But clearly, quantum computing is breaking ground in the way because you have to rethink about the problem and you have to rethink all of the things about that. Uh, if you are interested, I will put a link below. There is a quantum computer. It is a five qubit uh, machine that is available free of charge from IBM. You can go out, set up a, a sign on, get a sign on to it, and you can submit jobs to run on it. There is a a full set of manuals. There's a, one that's an introduction for people that don't understand quantum at all. And then there's a detailed manual that you can, that you can go through. And then there's a, a very easy way of, of doing visual programming in order to set up a run. And, uh, and you can go and play with it at your leisure. There's a, also, I'll put another link. There's a guy who did uh, a simulation uh, for Raspberry Pi, and it also can submit jobs to the uh, Qubit machine as well. So you can run the jobs on the Raspberry Pi, and then uh, and then also you can optionally turn a flag on, and it'll submit it. So I, again, I hope you enjoyed this uh, short video today. It's something that I've been wanting to do. Uh, so uh, and, and if uh, you did, please like and subscribe. And as always, hope to see you again real soon. Bye for now.